We just finished our legislative session and we're doing our wrap up. We've had phenomenal representatives, delegates and senators talking about their efforts in this last legislative session. And now to close us out, we have a phenomenal young dynamic delegate, Delegate Nadarius Clark, that's going to talk about his wrap up and also his big announcement to you. It's Say the Word. I'm Dr. Eric Laville. We'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back. It's Stay the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Laville. We're so happy to have you as always joining us on this Sunday, beautiful Sunday here in Hampton Roads as we broadcast always from the campus of the Norfolk State University, home of the Spartan Nation, from WNSB Hot 91, the soul of VA, the baddest radio station in town. Having we have with us always in the studio our producer who keeps us right and tight uh, on the radio, Marvin Folks, also known as DJ Scandalous, which you can hear every day, Monday through Friday from 2 to 6 p.m. on Saturdays. And yes, the hardest working man in radio, he's here in studio with us right now. You know, for those of you that have been listening to the show, you know that we do the legislative series every January and February here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And then March, we do our wrap up session where we bring back uh, policymakers and we bring them back to talk about their efforts in the legislative session, their their successes, their failures uh, or lessons learned, I like to say. Uh, and then also what's on the horizon. So to wrap us up, we have with us one of the most dynamic young representatives in the Virginia legislature, none other than the Darius Clark, delegate for the 79th district here in the Commonwealth and also here in Hampton Roads. Delegate Clark, how are you today? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me back on the show. It's uh, definitely good to be back up here. And thank you for the uh, kind introduction. I really appreciate it. <laughs> well, listen, I, I only speak the truth on this show because uh, it's too hard to make this stuff up. You know, um, I'm up there in the halls, you know, doing the session, uh, representing the university. And, you know, I see legislators in action. And when I say you're one of the most dynamic young legislators up there, I, I really mean that. The things that you're doing for your community. Uh, for your district, you came in with a purpose, targeted, and uh, you're doing it. You're doing it. <laughs> so definitely the people on the 79th are lucky to have you. Now, I will say this. I'm just going to throw this out there. I know I said it before. You know, we we do welcome, we support all HBCUs, so we do welcome a Virginia Union graduate uh, on the show. <laughs> so. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. I love all my HBCUs. Absolutely. And listen, thank you for your support of of Norfolk State and uh, the other HBCUs uh, for our bills that we have. You know, you're one of the definitely one of the big supporters and we definitely appreciate all that you have done. So we're going to get right into it. You know, one thing about this show, I like to bring movers, shakers, policymakers to discuss issues important to the community. And w- one of the most important issues is what took place in the legislative session. You know, if you could give us your uh, assessment uh, of, in time in the session itself. Yes, well, my office was, was really busy this session. It was the, the short session of uh, this, this year, so it was only 45 days. Uh, but we were able, uh, some of the things my office did, we were able to bring 200 students from Hampton Roads from different uh, high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools up to the Capitol to get the experience, the witness session in person, to get a tour of the Capitol and ask questions and interact. So we was uh, definitely happy that we could do that. And we also sent over 2,000 uh, honor roll letters out to students um, in the 79th District and in Hampton Roads that made uh, honor roll this year. So we made sure that we, uh, one thing we wanted to emphasize this year is uplifting the youth and making sure they're getting an experience um, um, some, and definitely experience that I didn't get the chance to get when I was in high school or growing up. So definitely uh, good to be able to do that. But this year I was definitely defending the line uh, when it comes to legislation and the priorities. But we also had some things that we were trying to add to uh, to, to pro- progress from. And um, some of those was uh, mental health this year. We know mental health 
in uh, Virginia and in America has been a huge concern. And I had legislation this year around that to make, uh, in Virginia, mental health professionals uh, would create a loan repayment program. So that way, uh, if you work in in Virginia after five years as a mental health professional, your VA loan, state uh, education loans, will be forgiven. Well, well, uh, but sad- well, well, very, very quickly, Delegate Clark, I, I, I want you to go into the legislation in just a moment, but I want to, I want to just go back just, just so for a second, and really talk about the impact of what you did for the youth. You, you mentioned, I mean, you're, like I said, you're one of the youngest delegates in the, um, in the legislature. You're 28, and you know, you said that you didn't get that chance to go up to the Capitol and see what was going on, and those letters that you sent out. You know, what were some of the um, reactions that you got from the students that had a chance to like see this huge, huge place, right? And be like, I can actually go in there? <laughs> right. Yeah, the, the reactions have been incredible. Uh, every uh, child that have come up there and every young person that came up there, they have been uh, they, they loved it. They're very in- interactive. They have great questions. They're prepared. Uh, I actually just uh, when I checked my mailbox the other day I had about 50 postcards from uh a uh, student from Granby that was uh, writing letters uh, thanking uh, and saying how much they appreciate the trip. Even a few of them said that they're interested in getting involved in, in politics and legislation wow. and, see their, and see a future for themselves in it. So it was, it was definitely a great response from it. Wow. And, you know, you talk about those letters that you sent out for honor roll. You know, I now listen. I I work in I work in government relations. Been involved for over two decades, and I remember when my sons got those letters in in the mail from their uh, legislators. It was like it was like getting a letter from like the president, right? <laughs> you, you know, I mean the you, the the very nice emblem, the uh, the symbol that's on it, your signature. Um, you know what what does that mean for you when you send those letters out? You know, to those students, especially in your district. It just means to me that it shows, uh, I know a lot of times, even in Chesapeake, when I go back to the uh, high schools, middle schools to visit, they tell me, like, you know, this helped push, keep them pushing, that someone um, is, is, is seeing, you know, their achievements and, and, and uh, giving them an accolade for it. Because sometimes every family doesn't have that same support system. Mm-hmm. So getting these letters sometimes make a difference to, to uh, different students that come from different backgrounds. Um, so, uh, and I personally sign each one of them uh, by hand. Uh, so I take it, you know, very personal to uh, to write these letters and and uh, send these out uh, throughout the district. Absolutely. And you know, when you say you sign them personally, I mean, I that that's something that a lot of people don't do, you know. But like I said, for you to actually put pen to paper, look at every name that's going out. I mean, I'm pretty sure that means a tremendous amount, you know, to everyone that that receives it. Um, when you talked about the legislative session and what the to- basically defending the line, um, talk, you know, in the last few years, we've talked about the achievements and the gains of, of the Democratic side of the control legislature and also the House, um, the actual executive House, where so many things, especially voting rights, were expanded and protections around it. So many great things to help the people on the ground, health care, health coverage was expanded, all these great things. You know, in this session, what have you seen as far as the fights against those gains that, that your party actually uh, uh, really achieved and really, really not only uh, achieved here, but really showed how to lead in the rest of the country? Where were some of those fights that, that you saw coming from the other side this session? Yes, um, most of the main fights that I saw this year was definitely around uh, voting rights, but also around uh, common sense gun reform and gun laws, and even around education and the history that's being taught in, in Virginia. Uh, I would say those are the main three that was um, uh, a really hot topic and a lot of debate for debate around, but also. You t- when we talk about reproduct- reproductive rights and we talk about the housing issue that Virginia is facing, uh, and when you throw mental health into there as well, uh, there was a lot of hot topics uh, this year. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's State of Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Claville. We have with us 
the one of the most dynamic young representatives in the Virginia legislature, none other than Delegate Darius Clark, representing the 79th district here in the Commonwealth of Virginia and also which is located in Hampton Roads. Uh, we're doing our legislative wrap up. And one thing we like to talk to our listeners about are some of the legislation that our, our representatives put forth. You know, what what happened with it? You know, where is it in the pipeline now? We know we're still waiting for the signature from the governor on a lot of things, uh, the budget itself. But we're going to pick uh, pick those apart in just a moment. But tell us, pick about two or three pieces of legislation and things that you've championed this session and let us know what happened with it. Yeah, so uh, this year uh, I, I put forth about 12 pieces, and I uh, keep co patriot about another 20, so I'll, I'll try my best to pick two or three. Uh, but I would say um, two that um, – one that I uh, really cared about this year. I cared about all of them deeply, but the mental health one was a really big one uh, this year. Uh, it was a priority for the Legislative Black Caucus. Uh, and this was something that I worked with numerous stakeholders throughout uh, Virginia to uh, to push forward. Uh, sadly, it was not an appetite from the other side. Uh, even though the current administration has uh, said that mental health is a concern and there is money for it, uh, we didn't get this one over the finish line. Um, but we did see progress with, and that was HB um, 1534. And when I go over to 15. HB 1532 it was my rent stabilization bill. I had this bill last year, and we brought it back this year, and we had some more strength. We had uh, much more uh, support from stakeholders, and we also had a Senate co-patron, uh, Senator, Senator uh, Jennifer Boisco, uh, also carried it in the Senate. Uh, so we did have um, a stronger push this year uh, to try to tackle what's happening with our housing issue mm-hmm. here in Virginia. As far as evictions, out of the top 10 cities of eviction, four of them here is, is, is here in Hampton Roads. Mm. So we need to do a, we need to have a serious conversation around legislation about what does affordable housing look like and what does uh, rent stabilization look like. It was a pretty straightforward bill. Uh, it, it wasn't mandating anything. It was giving cities a local uh, – it was just giving cities an option if they choose to put forth a – ordinance to adopt the provision, and it will just say that basically rent will have to increase at the same rate of inflation. Um, and so, and it will have also some stipulations that wouldn't hurt new developments. So we'll have a five-year gap to make sure uh, new developments can still get attracted, come to the areas. So there was a lot of um, places there that we made sure that we wasn't hurting any economic growth or any uh, new developments to the area, but we need to do something to address the problem because uh, housing is an issue and the affordability of it is an issue here in, in Virginia. Um, but one of the things that we did get over the finish line was a – Bill uh, HB uh, 2082, and that uh, it has made its way to the uh, governor now. Uh, and that was a Virginia ran, Virginia Residence Landlord and Tenant Act. So that one is to now um, make sure that all employees uh, that have access to keys to your apartment have a background check uh, to ensure safety. Because sometimes um, there was a incident actually in northern virginia where someone was killed because someone had access to her apartment Mm. and we want to make sure they're keeping everyone protected by making sure that basic background checks happen to anyone that has uh you know rental unit uh keys to get access to to people apartments right you know i want to you know those are those are some extremely extremely important initiatives and bills that went forward what actually happened to the housing portion, and also that 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 last one with uh, criminal background checks. Yeah, so criminal background check passed the House and it passed the Senate, so that is on its way to the governor. He has now uh, about a week or so to act on all the bills that is uh, going up to him that passed both chambers. Right. Um, so hopefully uh, he signs it, um, but they'll uh, we'll have reconvene in about a month or so. To determine what he uh, what action he takes on it, so we're still looking to see what action is going to be taken from the governor uh, before we get to recently. Absolutely. And then no, with ahead. how with the housing bill, that one died in subcommittee um, on both sides. Uh, it died in committee on the Senate, and it died in subcommittee in the House. Um, and 
the mental health one also, uh, it made it out of committee and it went to appropriations and it died in appropriations. Oh, wow. You know, it's amazing to me when you have those great ideas that really should benefit everybody. And what, what you just presented benefits everybody, right? Uh, because you have, when persons are evicted, they lose their homes. Number one, the children in that house is displaced. Number two, their studies in school are disrupted, and which impacts the entire class and the teachers and the system itself. Uh, the person that's working, their employment is disrupted because now they're having to juggle back and forth. The stress level rises. You impact their mental health and physical health. And then on top of that, you know, you've got to, you know, rent that other place out. So you go through that process. Why do you think something like that really just, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Why do you think something like that fail this session? It, that's a great question. And <laughs> that is something I ask myself when, when we're, uh, you know, presenting these bills in committee and half the time, you know, there's not a straightforward uh uh, reason sometimes bills are laid on the table, so they're technically they're not uh, PBI, which is passed by indefinitely. Mm-hmm. So it's a nicer way of killing the bill. Uh, but a lot of times there's not a clear explanation for why these bills are killed. Um, and I think the best explanation is just elections have consequences. Um, so when we don't elect right the right people to make the, the best decisions on behalf of everyone and, and also their, their constituents, then this is what we have. We have a very polarized um, house and we have petty politics going on that's stopping progress from getting done because they're worried about who's taking home a win or not based on is Virginia taking home a win. Absolutely. And then we talk about the Hampton Roads area. Now, for those who are looking, that have been looking around, we see like several cities that are that are building uh, new uh, uh, places to live, whether it be uh, various communities, home communities or, or apartment buildings. And they're building in places that in, historically have been dilapidated or just become dilapidated. But I look at the people that live in the area. And a lot of times it doesn't seem as those people that live in the area can really afford to stay there. So you go through this, this, this season of what's called gentrification, right? Um, What are some of your concerns, you know, for what, what we're seeing happening across Hampton roads as far as home affordability? Yeah. So gentrification is a real issue and there is a way to make a neighborhood, uh, you know, more modern and, and without displacement. And that's something that we need to look into, and, and that takes uh, that just means we all have to work together and make sure that first we're making sure the citizens that live in these places are taken care of first before we look at how we redeveloping uh, the, these places. We, we do not need to displace people. People that have grown and been raised and born in these places now, like you said, can't even afford uh, to live in places where they've been living for for decades. Um, so I feel like this is it, this is definitely something that could be legislated, but it's also something at the local level when we're talking about bringing developments and new things to, to our localities. We need to make sure that we're making decisions that's going to impact uh, positively for people that may become displaced, but displacement isn't something that we should even be considering. Uh, we need to make sure that we can go into communities, modernize them without displacing them, bringing businesses here, um, as well, uh, so there's a way to do it. Other places have done it. Uh, you see it in, in in Atlanta. You see it in other uh, cities where they are doing uh, modernization or gentrification without displacement. Uh, so we, we need to look at other ways to uh, to combat that. But that is definitely a problem here. Well, you know, a lot of persons say, "Well, we don't know if it could be done." But you just mentioned, you know, a couple of places that are actually doing it. That's not too far from us. What is is there? Do you think there's an uh, aversion to not look at who's doing it the right way and see if we could do it here? Um, yeah, and I think it also starts making sure that the the group or the, the people that's at the local level and at the state level, that it reflects the community that they're affecting. Uh, and make sure that everyone's at the table. And there needs to be community stakeholders and, and people from the neighborhoods in these in these conversations. Uh, so making sure that everyone is at the table, because sadly, when people aren't at the table, they're on the menu. So someone, <laughs> if you don't have community involved while you're talking about changing their community, then you're ultimately not uh, 
if you, definitely if you're an elected official, you're not doing what you're set out to do, and that's serve mm-hmm. the community. Absolutely. You know, my favorite congressman, who I believe uh, I've said it all the time, the smartest congressman on Capitol Hill, Congressman Scott, he says it all the time. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So, yes. like you said, we got to have people from the community at the table. And when they can't get there, we've got individuals like yourself that's on the ground representing the people doing it for us. So, you know, the session is over. And as our listeners know, this year, the year of 2023, every single position, every single elected official here in the Commonwealth of Virginia has to run for re-election. Um, and also, here in the Commonwealth, we are there are individuals in the Virginia General Assembly are running in districts that are different. So every 10 years, we redraw the lines. And this year, we had a new system, which... I was out front against saying that's a good idea in theory, but it was a terrible idea in practice, and it ended up being a terrible idea. Uh, but we've got new districts uh, that our legislators are representing and going to have to be going to have to run in. So we're going to do a whole education series, and we're going to be out in the community talking about this to make sure people understand who they're voting for this time around and so forth. Uh, but you know, we've got a lot of legislators that said, "Hey, I'm done." Uh, so far, we got 35 delegates and senators that said, I think I'm done. You know, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and retire. So we got a, a new crop of uh, individuals, policymakers that want to fight for the people uh, that are going to be elected and in the legislature for the first time. Um, but you've made an announcement and uh, you've got something coming up uh, this year. Well, first of all, are are you going to retire? Uh- <laughs> So I will, I will be resigning, but I'm not retiring. Okay, okay. So you're going to resign from the 79th district, is that correct? Yes, yeah, that's correct. So you heard it here. Delegate the Darius Clark will be resigning from the 79th district here in the Commonwealth. But I don't think it stops there, right? No, not not at all. All right. So what do you have? Well, what do you have to tell us here on Stay of the Water? Yeah, so uh, after my resignation, well, actually, last year, let me backtrack, last year in February, February 4th to be exact, I announced uh, my intentions to run in the new newly formed 84th district because, like you said, redistricting happened, and now we're all running in this new district at the time where all uh, 100 seats are up in the House and all 40 in the Senate. Uh, so I made the decision last year to run in the new 84th district here in Hampton Roads. The 79th district has changed about two, two to three times uh, in the last five years. <laughs> yeah. Now, and now the 79th district is going to Richmond. It won't even be located here in Hampton Roads anymore. Um, so I will be uh, resigning the 79th and moving over to the 84th district. It was about five minutes from uh, my current district. Uh, so I will be going uh, to the new 84th district, which is now part of. Suffolk, Franklin, Isle of Wight County is still a part of Chesapeake, and uh, that's the district I'm running in this year uh, for re-election. Uh, I do have a primary this June, and then I will be on my way to the general in, in November. Um, so, yes, that's that's uh, my announcement that I will be uh, resigning the 79th, but I am running in the new 84th district. All right, you heard it here. You will be running a new 84th. Now, well, it is, it, for, the, for the listeners, is that still a delegate district or is it a Senate district? So that is a it's still a delegate district. It's just it's, it's a little bit bigger than my current district, uh, which is three cities or uh, three localities. Now I'm going to uh, a four locality uh, district, but it's still the same amount of constituents. All right, sounds good. So you will be running now. Resigning? Have you resigned the 79th yet? Yes. Okay. So he's resigned the 79th, and we'll be running in the new 84th. 84th. So. You got a you got a much larger geographical area, uh, and it's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, with the energy that you have, and I see you with the energy in the General Assembly, I know that you're you're definitely up for the task. Um, if individuals want to get involved, want to support, how can they do that? Yes, definitely. They can definitely get involved by going on my website, clarkfordelegate.com. They can click the events tab and let them know everything that we have going on. Or you can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, at uh, Clark for Delegate or Nadarius Clark DA. Um, but also, I just want to um, 
make sure I let you know the importance of winning the 84th district. The 84th district is now one of the most competitive districts in the state. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're going to be all hands on deck. Uh, The current 79th district is a plus 10 district. Uh, We're talking about BPI, but now we're going over to the the 84th, which is a plus two. Um, So a plus two district is much more competitive. um, And we already see attacks coming from Republicans. We already see ads coming from Republicans uh, against myself because they know how important the 84th district is. uh, And we need to take back the House. And we cannot uh, take back the House majority without holding holding on to the 84th. You know, when you talk about the importance, you, you mentioned elections have consequences, the importance of voting. Um, if you could, I mean, tell us, tell our listeners just, just how important this upcoming election is and what's what's really at stake from not just your district and representing the people, but also the leadership in the House and the Senate. Yes, definitely. It's so much at stake this year, and I know uh, people probably get tired of of everyone saying every year we you know we get up and say this year is the most important year but every year is important and this year is going to be so crucial because the the entire legislative body is changing and like you said 35 new, new members are at minimum is going to be coming to the to the legislature and that's going to be about a record i believe uh, that virginia hasn't seen and if so it has been you know about over 100 years um so this is going to be crucial to how uh, like you said, leadership is is going to want to look how committees are going to ha- have a new leadership. Um, but there's also going to be so much new rec- uh, representation, which I'm excited for uh, to see the change in the, in the legislature. Uh, you know, right now, being the youngest member, uh, being 27 years old, the average age in the House is about 60. Um, so that's the average, by the way. <laughs> that's the average. <laughs> yes. So seeing more diversity and, and seeing uh, – because diversity and having making sure all voices are at the table when we're debating and when we're putting forth uh, legislation only helps us better Virginia. It makes it, it makes it makes us uh, more well-rounded and makes sure that we can have a fair debate when we're talking about issues that affects all of us to make sure that everyone is there, uh, you know, to speak on behalf of, of their of their districts. So I'm definitely excited to see the uh, the change in the legislature, and I'm excited for all the new candidates. I heard this year is uh, a record-breaking year for uh, black candidates running for uh, the state House and state Senate. So definitely excited uh, for that as well, to see uh, potential growth in the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. Um, and I plan to be a part of that growth. So I'll, I'll be gone for a few months out of the legislature, but come June, uh, I'll be right back uh, you know, swinging, but I'm not going anywhere. We're still putting in work in the 84th district now. We uh, just opened our office here in the 84th district on West Washington Street in downtown Suffolk. We're having kickoffs this weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday, uh, but you can find that on, on the website as well. Absolutely. That's Delegate Nadarius Clark, who is who has resigned the 79th district, but is running for re-election, or actually election, in the new 84th district, the new 84th district. He's out in the community making sure that you know who he is in that new area. Uh, those that, that he represented in the 79th, you're no stranger, no stranger to his work and what he's doing. Of course, you know, here in the Spartan Nation, we're no stranger to him as well. Great supporter, always on campus here and supporting our efforts. W. Clark, give us that information one more time. Yeah, so, um, the information is ClarkTheDelegate.com, and when you go up there, go to events, and we'll let you know all of our events upcoming. You can sign up to our events this weekend that's happening. We're having our office open it this weekend, which is Saturday at 12 and Sunday at 2. And also follow us on a social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Clark for Delegate or the Darius Clark VA. You've got it. And once again, we thank you for joining us as you listen to Stay the Water, where we bring movers, shakers, and policymakers to you to discuss issues important to the community. Join us every Sunday here at 10 a.m. on WNSB Hot 91, the soul of VA, as we broadcast live from the biggest and baddest and best HBCU in the Commonwealth in the country. That's the Norfolk State University. As always, be great, do good, and God bless. We'll see you next week.